here we are at the famous, architecturally famous, you would agree, yes, the Barbican? Iconic, yeah. yeah. Iconic. People say you either love it or you hate it, you know, <laughs> I was told that. Well, the Barbican itself, like you said, it's one of the sort of um, most well-known examples of brutalist, modernist architecture. I like that word, brutalist. Brutalist. I thought it was brutalist because it's so stark, yeah. but actually because the concrete and it's like yeah. a French kind of term. I agree with you. People say they love it or they hate it. When I first came here, I hated it, <laughs> but now I love it. They exactly. kind of understand what it's all about. But the original plantings here were done in the 80s. This is all a 1970s development. The gardens came in in the 80s. It's difficult to kind of realize when you're here that this is all a roof garden. Right. So it looks like it's a garden on the ground, but underneath actually we're standing on top of a gym. About how much uh, soil? We got about uh, minimum is 200 millimeters, which is about eight inches. Uh, we can get up to about three feet in some right. places where you've got the trees, but I guess most of it's about a foot deep in terms of its depth. Um, but the reason these gardens were redone is that about five or six years ago, there was a leak in the waterproofing underneath and there was water getting into the buildings below. And because of the technology at the time, they, they couldn't find out where the leak was. So they had to strip everything off, all the gardens that were here, everything, completely re-waterproof, re which gave the chance to start again. And I was brought in to reimagine what, what this could look like. The driver though, interestingly, was that the previous gardens, which were roof garden, intensive roof gardens, right. lush and green and lawns everywhere and you know, sort of really kind of conventional, but they could only be kept that way because of an automatic irrigation system that kept pumping water in all the time. And that just becomes unsustainable. There's nowhere to harvest rainwater here. It's all treated drinking water. Right. And the City of London Corporation, which manages this site, said, well, in the future, we're going to maybe more like California, right. where we have months and months on end with no water. We're not going to be able to irrigate, so we're going to sort of future-proof uh, our landscapes. And this is, this is an example of doing it. So the um, big element was to try and do plantings which didn't need to have automatic irrigation in them. Well. And that automatically then leads to something much more naturalistic and something meadowy. The color schemes, gorgeous. I actually think hard about color because I think, you know, if you have this beautiful naturalistic impression and you work with color, it takes it up to a whole new level. So I wanted bright, hot colors where it's sunny, but then actually as you move into the gardens, it's much more shady and dark. And so I try to put a lot of white flowers and, and things which will bring light into the shade. So you can see a real transition from from white and light through to hot colors in the main open areas. I have to say, what I really love about these plantings is your use of silver and, and gray. Well, you and see, I, that, that, that almost automatically comes from the fact that we're not putting water on this. Right. And even though these plants from, come from all different places in the world, because they come from dry habitats, they almost naturally have that silvery gray, blue gray color. In here, example, the flowering plants, for example, it's pinks and it's blues and it's purples with white flowers, and they kind of then work naturally with the silvery grey foliage. The silver really helps connect with the colours of the hardscape. Some people were really wedded to the modernist idea, and modernist architecture traditionally had a very um, minimalist landscape. <laughs> so that's being kind. <laughs> okay, but so the idea it, yeah. of horticultural diversity was seen as sentimental fluff and actually what you needed is hard sort of monocultures and clipped evergreen shrubs and you know yes. just two or three different plants. Um, so there's a bit of opposition to that from just a very small number of people but the vast majority of people say what really works here is the contrast between the really loose natural feel of being in a huge wildflower meadow against the brutalist architecture yes. and the two work with each other and I think they actually work better with each other than if they were both on their own. I think they, they actually boost each other. I would absolutely agree. You know I love the grasses but man does not live by grass alone. So, and for me now meadows, it's just really an excuse to plant bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bulbs year-round. You've got bulbs in here that pretty much we go year-round, right? We kick off. Um, again, I think maybe it's apparent. 
when I work with plants like this, even though they're very diverse, um, and there may be 50 or 60 or 70 different flowering plants and grasses here, what I try and do is just at any one time have just two or three looking good. So instead of having this sort of hodgepodge of all yeah. sorts of things thrown in and it, you know, all sort of is really crazy, I try and keep it simple. So for example, the bulbs in the spring, I just have red species tulips here. So everywhere fills up with just the same red tulip and the red looks great amongst all the emerging fresh green foliage. And to me that's far better than having 20 different colours of bulbs all over this place. Right. And it's the same when we look through here, at the moment we've got alliums coming through everywhere. So I guess that's the principle with me with working with the colours of the plants. But it's interesting what you say about the grasses, because I started out making meadows which were flower rich. Right. And I kind of said, oh, we don't want grasses in there. <laughs> they kind of get in the way, okay, they're so all untidy and scruffy. Had... I've changed completely now. It's like, okay, give me your ratio of grass to flowers, approximately. I mean, obviously it changes from situation to situation, but what's the range, you know, that you, or, or, or you said you find yourself now using more grass maybe? And well, less I flower? was saying these plants we can see here, it's almost like half and half. Mm. So I'd agree. maybe slightly more of the flowering plants, but actually not much. And the grasses, if the grasses were not here in these numbers, this would be a completely different feel. It would just be yet and another so, perennial yeah, border. Yeah. And well, you've hit the nail on the head really, actually as a bit of an aside, I've become increasingly fed up with the formulaic nature of perennial borders and perennial plants. Right. That's where you have the same plants used everywhere and the same sort of combinations and there's kind of no innovation in many ways with it. Right. So you won't find this anywhere else, no. this combination. No. And that's what I like to try and do, you need combinations so all the time. It's diverse, but it's simple at the same time. It is. I love it. The way it's designed I to doff work. my cat. <laughs> you know, it's layers coming through. So if you were to be here in the winter, the euphorbias would be there, same sort of form. Right. The grasses says there would be there actually with the seed heads there. Right. Um, but then everything actually would be much more simple. All the flowering seed heads and everything would be out of the way. And then you get these things coming through continuously. In all my years of looking at grasses and following grasses, Cesleria needed it for us as one of the very first Cesleria's to bloom. Right? Yeah. Like everything else sort of comes later. So pure white as it emerges, now it's, you know, becoming tan. It's the first and only grass I've ever seen bees on. Have you ever seen bees on a grass? Never. <laughs> I hadn't either. I was like, how can this be? Just about the Cesleria. I think a lot of people would say it's a nice little grass, but you know, it's, it's kind of an insignificant little thing. Yes. And we'd be using the big structural things. Actually, I think it must be my favorite now. Um, Partly because it flowers so early. So here it started flowering in March, mainly flowering in April. Right. Actually, now we're in towards right. the end of May and it so still nasty. looks fresh, but um, this will stay like this right the way through here until February, March. In fact, if it didn't cut it back, you'd have the fresh, the fresh flower heads both. coming up alongside the old ones. And what I really like about it in the spring, when everything's cut back and you've got the bulbs and things, it's like these, these flower heads are dancing over the top of everything else. Mm. And then all the other things come through, but it's just an ever present um, I wouldn't call it ground layer. I, I don't know. I call it. I don't know what I call it. Well, that's it. just it. In, I mean, infiltrator. there's such a nice separation of foliage and flower, yeah. and then just the right amount of halictotrichon, you know, over the top. Yeah. So, you in know? terms of the design, there's probably five or six times as much of the Cislaria as the halictotrichon. Right. Um, but it's just just the right density, I think, to um, to weave its way through and give the movement. But actually, this is quite a good place to look here at the planting method. Right. Um, when I plant somewhere, although though I haven't got a planting plan, I, don't, I never use planting plans where everything is spot located. I use mixes and zones. Uh, you or, probably or saved or your client you a zillion dollars by saying, I'll just let me yeah, put them where yeah. they go. But the way I do it is that I really do think in layers. And rather than saying, take an area like this, which is sort of 10 yards by mm -hmm. five yards. Right, right and then say, well, all these plants will fill it all up at once. Yeah. I do it species by species across the whole area. So there these Cesleria's, right. I set out just that. Just the Cesleria's, um, right. And I start with the grasses, because they then form yes. 
the, the I matrix. See, right, I say that's the and framework that everything... It's a framework. Is. I see it like a bit like, you know, the Swiss cheese, the cartoon cheese with big holes in it. Right. Uh, so they make the cheese and then they, they the holes fill in with everything else. But you kind of see it here. I plant in groups of three and then one. So it gives a bit of... Well, if I can see it here. Right. There's three cesareas right. and then one. And that's the unit I repeat. And it gives... Three and then one. Three and one, one. Three and then one, three and then one. That's how I build up the framework. You can kind of see it here with these, these manicures. Of right. these main That's the structural plants. secret that has been revealed I here today told you that. for the first time. And, um, <laughs> and then, so that's the main plants go in like that. And then I start to, you know, dot around things nice. a bit more. But that's kind of how I make my framework up. Nice. The great thing about this type of planting, as you know, is that it changes week to week, month to month. So. In a month's time, it will be shimmering white with these melics. I can see um, salvia, salvia caradonna. There's a lot of that which nice. will come up as, uh, as spikes. And also um, oregano, yep. which is a late summer thing for us. So uh, asters as well, lots of asters. So um, the intention is the flowers are mostly blue or yellow, and they work with this silvery gray foliage. And of course we leave the seed heads, so these allium seed heads will sit here for another couple of months probably. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't get the soul, you know, it's like they're deadheading. It's like, stop! The deadheading is a bit of a principle that we don't do that. Um, and it's one of the ways to cut down the ongoing maintenance. However, um, for the winter what I do do, um, instead of leaving everything standing and then chopping it back at the end of the winter, which oh. is a sort of standard thing, so, yes. um, we thin it out. So as soon as one species in the planting starts to look really scruffy or starts to fall over, that'll get cut back hard and taken right. out right the way through. Leave some of the everything other things. Else. And what happens is it just gradually thins it out and opens it all out. Here's another one of the good repetition. The armeria, yeah. the same you know, form as the alliums. Well, for, it's Sorry. interesting for roof gardens, you know, um, you can choose a lot of plants from dry meadows or steppe type habitats, but also a lot of coastal things. So this right. naturally That's grows on grows cliffs. Dunes. Right. You get dunes or cliffs, and again, where you've got no water, or very little water. Oh, look at this, here's some uh, Brisa Maxima. Yeah. Nice. Love that. It's definitely quaking. Well, when you talk about catching light and motion, it's like drop the mic, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, um, this is growing things hard and tough. So they're not in soil. Right. They're in an artificial growing medium, which is mostly crushed brick and expanded clay. It has some organic matter, but it's really free draining. So it's perfect. You know, it's, the plants are hard and tough. Mm. Um, they're not soft and flabby. Nigel, thanks for chatting with us today. This is spectacular. I would I'd encourage everybody to come see it. You know, for a dry garden, that doesn't mean that it can't be something incredibly gorgeous. I think, I think the other thing is that for a really urban location, um, you can go really wild. And I think it's something that we still let yet to learn, really. A lot of people say, well, for urban locations, it has to be neat and tidy. Um, people actually like the naturalistic look much more, the right. meadowy look. They need it. But it needs to be structured. It can't just be completely leave alone. Right. So that's where the color and the structure and the forms come in. Um, to, to actually give it that pepped up. Uh, well, listen, if we get to come back, I, I can't wait to see what you, you're going to do with the other half of it. Yeah, it should stretch project. the horizon. All right. <laughs> Thanks.